Good morning, second service. Morning, second service. This is, this is my favorite service personally. Um, and it's because this is the, the groundbreaking service. This is where, I feel like this is where we partner with God. This is where we are. We are doing the real work of ministry by just being here every Sunday. And, you know, we're building something great. So I enjoy um, the service the most. I feel like we should, we should bring hard hats every Sunday and just wear hard hats for the second service just so that it feels like we're actually, we're actually breaking ground because it's, it's just really an amazing service. Um, today, I have been asked to, to do part two of our sermon series live this. Um, Londi kicked us off last week and he shared his testimony about how Deuteronomy 31 verse 8 has, has been the verse that he's anchored his life on. And it's carried him through, through, through difficult seasons in his life. And today I'd like to share also my testimony. Um, but before I do that, I was looking at Mlondi's sermon last week. And uh, the one thing that stood out for me was how he was sharing uh, pictures of his family, his wife and kids, Lita and them. And I thought, let me do the same. Let me also share pictures of my family. So there's a picture of my, my little family there. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, there's, there's my wife uh, in red, and there's our beautiful son standing there at the back. Uh, um, yeah, just, just one kid, just one kid, Bianca. For now, for now. Um, <laughs> and yeah, that's, that's my family. Um, and just as we get into the word today, I'd, I'd just like to pray, if that's okay with you. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, for, thank you for your word, your word that is alive, that is living and your word that brings life into into our hearts we pray lord that as we get into it today that it will come alive in our hearts and in our lives and it will it will it will manifest as you have intended it to i ask that as i'm standing on the stage this morning that you will you will be a vessel you will use me as a vessel lord of this word in jesus name amen um, firstly, I'd like to just honor everyone in this church who's just allowed me to get to this place. I think it's, I don't take it lightly that I, I've been asked to share the word. And I know some, some of the people have already left, but I see Richard and Grace are here. And just people who've, who've discipled me over the years. Um, I don't think I would be here without, without you guys. And I just want to say thank you, Pastor T and Pastor Amy, also in their absence. I mean, yo, I've, I've listened to Pastor T's sermons. I've, I've listened to a lot of them. Um, back during COVID, we used, we used to record on Saturdays. So I'd have to hear the sermons twice, on Saturday and Sunday. Um, so <laughs> it's, it, it, it was really a privilege. And, and just the fact that they are, they've decided to, to ask me to share the word while they're away um, is also a great honor. They're in Durban, so please pray for them. They're running a 10-day evangelism uh, internship. And so please pray for them and keep them in their prayers uh, over the next 10 days. So my testimony today. I, I said in the first service that I'll only share my life verse at the end. So if you're planning on leaving, you have to stay now because the verse only comes at the end. But I'd like to firstly share my testimony. And I, 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 I struggled with anxiety for a long time in my life. Um, primary school, high school, varsity. I struggled with anxiety. And for me, it, was, it, was, it wasn't debilitating. It also wasn't medically diagnosed anxiety disorder. And even though it wasn't, it was still pretty bad. I used to have this gut-wrenching feeling whenever I was anxious. Whenever I'd go through these seasons of anxiety, I'd, use, I'd have this. It felt like there were knots in my stomach, literally. And it wasn't, it wasn't triggered by anything. I don't, even, I don't even know where it started from. I don't know what the root of it was, but, but I knew that I had anxiety. And in 2019, it got bad. I had my first ever panic attack. So I was in varsity, and um, as I was studying for an exam, I started to struggle to breathe. And I couldn't figure out, why am I struggling to breathe? And so I quickly ran back to my room and I called my dad and I just started crying 
for about 25 minutes. And I just could not stop crying. And that was the first time I had a panic attack. Um, and during, during that season, I, I was in therapy. I was seeing a therapist at Varsity. We used to have these therapists that you were allowed to see for free. So I used to see a therapist. And I remember feeling or questioning, why am I struggling with a panic attack while seeing a therapist? That was my question. Why, why is this happening? I mean, I was going to therapy, and I remember even that week, I went to therapy, and the thing that my therapist and I were talking about, I was telling her how I, I, I've developed this coping mechanism where whenever something happens in my life, or whenever I'm going through something new or something difficult, I think of the worst. I think, what's the absolute worst thing that could happen in this scenario? And if I think about the worst thing that could happen in this scenario, it will not happen. I will basically prevent it from happening if I think about it. And it then led into overthinking, where every scenario in my life, I'll just overthink it so that I could supposedly prevent it from happening. And that week I had a panic attack. And I remember when I was in th my therapy session that week, my therapist, when I said that to her, she said to me, hmm, that's interesting. And <laughs> when you're in therapy and your therapist says that, after you felt like you've said something very insightful, it's like, okay, is, do I need to be admitted into a, a psychiatric ward? Because <laughs> clearly you don't agree with me. And Anyway, I had, I had the panic attack, called my dad, and he prayed for me for, for half an hour. And all he did was pray for me. And after that, I, I started to realize that actually I do not want to live this way. I do not want to live the rest of my life with anxiety. I can't do it. I can't do this. I was only 21 at that time, and I just felt like I can't, I can't do this. I don't have problems. I don't have grown people problems. And yet here I am having anxiety. I don't have a, a wife, children, you know, I don't have bonds to pay off. I don't have I don't have those many problems. Why am I struggling with anxiety? And a year a year and a half into that, after that, uh, God started to take me on a journey of understanding what the root of my anxiety was. So for me, it was not a chemical imbalance. And I do know that there are people who struggle with anxiety and depression where there is a chemical imbalance in their mind and it is meant to be cured through medical means. And I think God has provided that for people to, to be healed through therapy and medication. And I, I do not discount that. I think that's God's form of healing people. But for me, I knew that that was not the issue. I knew that there was no chemical imbalance within my brain. I knew that it was not a medical thing that needed to get sorted out. But I also knew that there was a problem. I knew that this was real. And so God started to reveal to me what the root cause of my anxiety was. And what it was is that I believed that I was in charge of my fate. I believed that if I could figure out the future and work absolutely hard at fixing it or preventing any possible issues that could happen, then I'd be okay. So I basically believed that I was Lord over my life. And that was the problem. For me, that was my issue, was that I was Lord over my life. And that's why I was overthinking, because I believed that I should solve all my problems. And over the years, God has revealed to me that at the root of it, it was out of lack of trust in God. I did not believe that God was really in charge and that he was in control of every single scenario and situation in my life. And so because he was in charge, he could handle everything that I went through. And over the years, I've, I've, I've learned to I've firstly gotten over the anxiety disorder. I think there was a disorder that God delivered me from because I think the gut-wrenching feeling that I felt in my stomach was not, it wasn't just a thought. I did not make that up. I actually felt that, and I feel that God delivered me from that first. Um, and so today I want to I wanna share, share how 
I've realized and, and how God has revealed to me how we deal with seasons in our lives where we struggle with it. Maybe you don't struggle with anxiety. And that's fine. But often what we do, and I still struggle with it, is this we go through seasons of tension where everything is just pressing at you. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe things are tight in your pocket. Maybe it's things at work that it, it just feels like the walls are closing in. What do we do in those seasons? What do we do? Who do we look to? Who do we turn to? And how do we even turn to God and say, Lord, I need you? And so firstly, I want to define what tension is. And so according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, tension is, def is defined as inner striving, unrest, or imbalance, often with physiological indication of emotion. And I think we all go through seasons of tension. If, you, if you've not gone through a season of tension, I, I dream to be like you. But even I go through seasons of tension, even today. I go through seasons where I, I worry, where I do feel anxious. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next week? I think right now there are three things in my life that are causing tension. The first thing is my ministry work. As, as some of you might know, I am part of the staff here. I volunteer here at church. And so I, I'm in a season where because I'm juggling a few things in my life, I am, I am not managing things properly. And so everything is pulling at me all at the same time. And I was talking to Richard about it a few weeks ago. We were having coffee. And he was saying to me, you need to, you need to sort this out because it is not healthy. You cannot, you cannot be having everything pulling at you all at the same time. Something needs to give. And so that's the one thing that's causing tension in my life. The second thing is that because I work in ministry and I'm a volunteer, I've started a photography business. And in this photography business, I mean, I started it from the ground up. And it's still in that initial phase where there's a lot of uncertainty where I can't, <laughs> I can't estimate how much I'm going to make next month. I'd love to, but I'm not there yet. And so I'm in this constant tussle with, with God about, Lord, is this going to sustain me? Is this going to sustain a family? The third thing that, that is causing tension in my life, and these are all good things in themselves. They are not, they are not, they are not bad things. These are God, things that God has, has given me and he's blessed me with. The third thing that I'm struggling with um, and that's bringing tension into my life is the relationship with the young lady that I'm with. Um, she's a beautiful young lady. And, and God willing, we, we plan on getting married, if God wills. Um, but in this season of waiting for God, we are having to constantly ask ourselves, is this really God? Is this God's will for us? And if it is, how is it going to happen? Because I definitely know that her parents want me to bring cows. And I don't know where I'm going to get the money for that. <laughs> I hope they watch this video and decide to give me a discount, hopefully. Um, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but, but fundraising, we can do fundraising after this. We'll start a GoFundMe. <laughs> um, but, but these things are bringing tension. And, and in themselves, these are God, things that God has given me. There are things that God has blessed me with, but, but I'm still finding myself in these seasons where I'm wondering, is this really God? I know, I know what people have said. I know that I've prayed about this. I know that I've heard God, but is this really God? Because it's not working out. You know, finances are not looking good. My bank account is not looking good. Is this really God? And so I'm having to ask myself then, how do I get over the tension? Because what happens with tension is that we don't avoid it. We face it and we conquer it. So I'd like to talk about how we conquer tension. And we're going to go into the word of God. Um, and the first, the first text of scripture that I'd like us to read into is 1 Samuel chapter 17. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, the Israelites are at war with the Philistines. They're in a battle. And here's this giant Goliath who comes every morning, 7 o'clock, he's there. 
I'm not sure if that's really the time, but he's there in the morning and he comes to the battle line and he taunts the Israelites. He just like disses them and he's like, whoever, whoever is worthy enough to come and face me, let him come. Let's fight. And the Israelites do not have a champion because their king Saul, the king who they asked God for, is also there shivering with them because he's also too scared to face this giant. And so I think 1 Samuel chapter 17, the whole chapter, I think it's a, it, it's a contrast of two types of ways we can deal with tension. I think the Israelites are both an example of what we should do and what we shouldn't do when in tension. Because the first thing they do is that because they've put their trust and their faith in this king, Saul, their faith is not in God. It was never in God, and that's why they asked for a king. Is that they are worried now. They're anxious. They're scared because here's this giant who's standing before them. And the one person who they put their faith in is not there confronting this giant. And then fast forward to verse 51. Here comes a little boy, David, teenager, young boy, shepherd boy. He was not even supposed to be there. It was by chance because his father had sent him to go and deliver resources and, and, and restock food for his brothers. And he gets to the battlefield and he hears this giant who's taunting the Israelites and the God of the Israelites. And he's appalled at the things that this giant is saying. He says, how can this giant say this about the God of heaven's armies. Who does he think he is? And he's like, you know what? Clearly you guys are not going to do it, so I will go and confront this giant. I've confronted bears. I've confronted, is it lions? Lions um, as a shepherd. So this is nothing for me. And he goes, he confronts this, this giant, and he kills him. And I want us to read verse 51. It says, then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut his head off. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. The bodies of the dead and wounded Philistines were strewn all along the road from Sharaim, as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the Israelite army returned and plundered the deserted Philistine camp. So this is a very interesting text because I think for me growing up in, in Sunday school, we, used to, we were told that we are the David in the situation that we must be like David and we must have faith and courage like David when we are from confronting the Goliath in our situation. But today I'd like, to, I'd, like to, I'd like us to look at this text from a different perspective where we are the Israelites in the scenario. And we, we, we are given the choice of how to then confront tension in our lives. We can look at it from the perspective of the Israelites who had put their faith in Saul and they were disappointed. They were anxious. They were scared. They were shivering. They, they were cowards, even. Or we could, we could see ourselves as the Israelites who were now chasing after the Philistines after David had killed Goliath. And I think the story of David and Goliath points to what Jesus has done on the cross for us is that Jesus died for us on the cross. He defeated death. He defeated sin. And we get to then live in the wake of that. We do not, we are not bothered by Goliath. Because Goliath is dead, his head has been cut off. And the Goliath in our situations, in our, in, in our, in our lives, has already been defeated. And we get to live in the wake of that. We get to go after those thoughts, those strongholds, those barriers in our lives that in Paul, in Paul says in 2 Corinthians, which I'd like us to read, it says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. This is verse 3. 
We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. And I've underlined the word knowing God. I'll come back to that. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And the reason why I underlined the word knowing God is because the knowing that's spoken about here is from the Greek word ginisko, ginosko rather. And in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for it was yada, when it was spoken about knowing, knowing God. And this knowing that's spoken about is defined as to know, especially through personal experience. So we get to know God through personal experience. We don't know him by just understanding what text says. We know him by understanding him personally in our lives. And so what Paul here is talking about is he's talking about these thoughts and these beliefs that prevent us from having that personal experience with God. And he says to us that we go after those thoughts and we conquer them and we defeat them. And of course we do that in evangelism. And, and when we talk about apologetics, defending the faith, we talk about basically having these conversations where you're talking someone through what believing in Christ actually means so that they can then come to Christ. And we do that. But it's not only in evangelism. We also have to do that in our daily lives, especially in these seasons of tension where we have these thoughts that are challenging what God says to us, that challenge us from knowing God, these strongholds that get in the way of us knowing God personally in our daily lives. And I'd like to read a quote that C.S. Lewis said in, in a book that he wrote, The Screwtape Letters. And so The Screwtape Letters is a, is a book um, of this demon uncle who's writing to his demon nephew. And he's basically giving him the blueprint of how to keep human beings in oppression. That's, that's the book. <laughs> it's a very interesting book. I, I really recommend it. And so this uncle, Screwtape, is, is writing to his nephew. And this is what he says to him. He says, there is nothing like suspense and anxiety for barricading a human's mind against the enemy. And of course, the demon's enemy here in this case is God. And so what he's saying basically is that the best way to prevent the human from knowing God through personal experience on a daily basis, keep him anxious. Just do that. Keep him in anxiety. You don't have to do all these other things. If you just keep him anxious every single day, you'll prevent him from having this personal relationship with God every single day. And I think the struggle that we have a lot of us today, is that we don't understand the enemy's tactics. We think that persecution is when you go to a country where you're not allowed to preach the gospel and you preach the gospel and you get killed for it. And so maybe that gives us a false sense of security because we don't live in those countries. We live in a country where you are free to share the gospel with anyone, anytime, anyway. And so that can leave us in a false sense of security where we feel that, oh, I don't face persecution. But the persecution that all of us face on a daily basis is the enemy persecuting us through our thoughts. He brings worry, he brings anxiety, he brings fear. And he says to you, did God really say that to you? Is God really going to show up in this scenario, in these seasons of tension, is God really going to do that? And if we're not aware of the enemy's tactics, we can't, we can't overcome this tension because we will, we, will, we will leave ourselves blinded. And so that's what we do, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, is that we go after those thoughts, just like the Israelites did after David killed Goliath is that now that the Philistines army's champion was dead, they had the confidence of then going after the Philistine army and pursuing them and driving them away from that territory. Because in that time, 
most of the war was over land. And so the Israelites had to go after the Philistines to gain the territory back, the territory that was rightfully theirs. But once they, they, they drove the, the Philistine army out of, out of the territory, they didn't just stop there. It wasn't a party after that. They went back to the camp of the Philistines, and, they say, and, and the word says that they plundered that land. They plundered that camp. And so what I'm assuming happened is that they came back to the camp, they found these tents where the Philistines were sleeping every day, and they just basically wrecked it. And I think one thing they might have found there were idols, because the Philistines were idol-worshipping people. And they probably had idols in those camps that they prayed to and worshipped and made sacrificed for sacrifices to every morning before going into battle, because that's what their, their faith was in. And so what the, the Israelites did when they plundered was that they went and they destroyed those idols. It's the same thing that God charges them to do later on in other chapters where he says to them, go into those lands and don't take anything for yourself. Wreck everything. And that is exactly what we do with our thoughts. Is that with these thoughts of anxiety, of worry, of fear, once we've already driven them out, and I'll talk about how we do that, once we've driven them out of our minds, we don't just stop there. The battle is not over. We go back to those places in our hearts and in our minds where these strongholds have been laying, have been sitting, and we plunder them. And we basically wreck everything because, as Jesus says in Matthew 12, after he had cast out demons, he says, what happens if you cast out a demon and the demon leaves this person? The demon goes into the desert and says, let me go back there. Let me see what, if, I can, if there's anything still left for me there. And the demon goes back sevenfold, so with seven other demons. And they go back to that same person, and they go back into that house, and if they find it empty, they will re-enter. And so for us, we do, not, we, do not, we do not leave it there. We then bring in the word because the word of God is our reinforcement. So I want to talk about how then do we overcome tension? How then do we overcome anxiety? This is how I did it, and this is how I've, I've, I've seen God do it in people's lives too. So just a quick testimony. Earlier this year, we, we had Connect here at church. We have Connect here on Fridays, and we were having Connect. We were doing the one-to-one -one booklet, which is our biblical foundations booklet that we do in every nation and as we were doing the step five of the one to one which talks about baptism in the holy spirit and we were we were praying with people to to learn how to pray in tongues there was this lady who was praying in tongues and she says well she was she was trying to learn how to pray in tongues and as we were praying with her she said the first time we asked her have you have you have you made any 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 improvements have you have you started praying in tongues and she says no actually when i start praying i start feeling anxious so she said and we said okay that's that's odd let's pray again and see what happens and so we prayed with her the second time and as we were praying with her she said the same thing that no man every time i start to pray i become anxious and so we asked her, do you, do you struggle with anxiety? And she says, yeah, I know I've struggled with anxiety for years, actually. It's, 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 it's difficult. Um, I have a job, and it's, it's very demanding. And even in that job, um, I, do, I do struggle with performance anxiety sometimes. And so I shared my testimony about how God has freed me from anxiety. And so we prayed with her. And we prayed with her to, to be free from this anxiety that she's been struggling for, with for years. And so a few weeks later on, she comes back to me and she says, you know, you will not guess what happened. So the day after we prayed at Connect, I got a call back home uh, from my mother that my child was in hospital. And normally things like that are what trigger my anxiety. But when my mom told me that, I did not, I did not have any anxiety. And it was clear that God had freed her from anxiety, had delivered her. And so 
I want to then talk about how we do that. And before I do that, I'd like to finally get to my life verse for today. Amen. The verse that has anchored, <laughs> that amen was too strong, my blab. <laughs> you've, been, you've been waiting for that. Um, this, this verse has been what's carried me through those seasons where either I've been anxious, or I've been worried, or I've been struggling to believe, or, or there's just been lack of peace in my life. And the verse is in Philippians 4 verse 6. And I'd like to read it. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's grace and his peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And this is the word. This is the word of God. And I think this verse, it gives, us, it gives us the blueprint of how to overcome tension, how to overcome anxiety. And so I'd like to, to talk about three things that we do in overcoming tension and anxiety in our lives. Last year, as a church, we said we do three things as a church. We said we sit down with God, we step up and equip ourselves, and then we go and we reach out the lost. And today I want to focus specifically on sitting down with God. Because I believe that's how we overcome tension. Amen. We cannot do it without God. I, I, I could not. And I mean, I went to therapy. And, and not to take a dig at therapy, I do believe that therapy works. I do believe that God has commissioned and has given therapists and psychologists a gift that comes from him to help people deal with mental health issues but for me therapy is not what helped what helped was when the word started to come alive in my life was when god started to show me the patterns and habits and strongholds that were in my life and so here are three things that i feel that philippians 4 verse 6 says the first thing is that we pray we spend time in prayer Prayer is the go-to solution for everything. It's like the Swiss army knife of life. If you have an issue, pray. If you're happy, pray. If you're sad, pray. We pray. And so that's the first thing we do. We need heavenly intervention in order to overcome tension. We cannot do it on our own. We need God's help. The second thing, now that we've we've driven out these strongholds out of our minds and out of our hearts, is that we reinforce ourselves with the word. As I said earlier, that we don't just leave those places in our hearts and our mind dormant once we've driven out the, all those strongholds and beliefs and you know, worries that we have. We don't just leave it dormant and say, okay, the battle has been overcome. We come back and we plunder, and we plunder through the word, because the word is truth. And so we do that through the word of God. And, and I just want to quote a song that um, I really love. It's by, by Hillsong, written by Benjamin Hastings. And he wrote this song in a season where his wife was struggling with anxiety. The name of the song is Peace. And this is one of the lyrics in the song. It says, your word remains truth even when my thoughts don't line up. And that's what the word is, is that it's truth. The word reveals what the counterfeit in our minds and in our hearts is. It exposes that. It is like, it is like a, a floodlight that comes and switches on. And suddenly everything becomes real. I have a horrible example, but I'm still going to say it. It's like when you switch on lights and there are cockroaches in the room. And like all those cockroaches start to scatter. That's what the word does when there are lies in our lives. Is that it comes and it switches on and those lies just scatter away. And then the third thing that we do, which I feel is, is important, is that we abide in God's presence. Yes. And we do that on a daily basis. In First Kings chapter 18, when Elijah such a man that we, we, we all look to, a man who did not die. 
when he's running away from Ahab and Jezebel, and he's in the wilderness, and he's tired, and he's tired of running, he's just disheartened, and he's, I think he was in tension. He gets to a tree, and he sits under a tree, and he says, Lord, take me, just take me, just kill me, because I cannot do this anymore. He's depressed, and he falls asleep, because obviously he's tired. And it says that an angel of God woke him up the first time, said, here, here's water to drink and food to eat. Drink and eat. And he does that, and he goes back to sleep. And he gets woken up the second time. More water and more food. And the Lord says to him, eat and drink, because the journey you're about to go on to is very long. And so he does that. And later on in the chapter, God then commissions him to go back to where he came from. Doesn't say run away. It says go back to where you came from. Go confront that tension. And I think that's what we need in our lives when we're in seasons of tension. We need prophetic vision from God. We need God to say to us, eat and drink and rest. And maybe go back to where you came from. Go back to that tension that you've been avoiding. And, and I've also had seasons in my life where it's been like that, where sometimes it just feels like the walls are closing in, and I just got, go to God in prayer, and I just then I say, Lord, I don't know. And then I take a nap, and then, you know, I wake up, and <laughs> then everything gets solved. And I was like, was a nap really what solved it? But it's not. It's God's presence. And, and that's, and, and resting. And resting, but resting in God's presence, abiding in his presence. And that's what we need on a daily basis. We cannot overcome tension without prophetic vision from God. A few weeks ago, I was, I was editing pictures. And so when I edit, I use a hard drive to back up my images. So everything is stored on my hard drive. It's a very small hard drive. But it's basically how it has my entire business in it. And so I'm editing, and my hard drive just stops working halfway through me editing. And I'm like, Lord, what's happening? I did not do anything to this hard drive. I promise I did not drop it in water. No one touched it. Nothing happened. I'm literally just editing. And I became so anxious because I thought, this is basically my whole business gone. I have this client that I need to deliver pictures to. I don't know how, what am I going to say to them. I'm definitely not going to tell them that my hard drive just stopped working. They will not buy that. And... I started praying, and I remember the, the song by Bethel, God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. Give me vision to see things like you do. And, and that became my prayer, Lord, show me what's happening. And he showed me that there was a spiritual battle, that the enemy was trying to, to frustrate me. And I remember God saying to me, the enemy is trying to wait you out. So he's, gonna, he's just going to wait you out. And that time I was praying, I was there in tongues, casting out demons. And I thought, okay, Lord, I will do this for 30 minutes and then I'll go back and check. And the Lord showed me that, no, the enemy is just, he's going to wait you out. And so that, that fueled me to keep on praying. And I just kept on praying and I kept on praying. And if I went to sleep, the hard drive was still not reading on my laptop. And I woke up the next morning and I just started praying again. And I plugged it in, and it was working. And it showed me that, that was, if, if I did not have vision from God to show me that if I, if I did not press into prayer and keep relying on God, I would have probably taken it to get fixed somewhere, and they would have told me that it doesn't work. Because the first thing I tried, confession, was YouTube. I said, YouTube, my, my hard drive is not working. And YouTube said, ah, your hard drive is dead. So that, that could have, I could have taken that as, as the truth, that, okay, this hard drive is dead. Basically, I need to go and give this person their money back because I will not be able to deliver their work. But it was the prophetic vision that God gave me to say, this is what's happening. And, and that's what we need in overcoming tension and overcoming battles in our lives, is that we cannot see things with the naked eye. It will not solve it. We need God to reveal to us what is happening in the spiritual and so that's how we overcome tension. And so I feel that one of the many reasons why God delivered me from the struggle with anxiety was so that this could be a testimony 
in Revelation, it says that, and they defeated the enemies by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And our testimony is so powerful. Amen. It is so powerful. I remember when we were praying for that lady who I spoke about earlier, and I just felt that God was saying that even with her family, there are people in her life that God wants to deliver from the same thing and that he wants to use her as a testimony. So it's not just for her. And I feel that it's the same thing for me today, that God did not just deliver me from anxiety and the struggle for myself only. I feel that this testimony is here today so that God can do the same in, in people's lives here today. So I'd like to pray for, for two groups of people. The first are people who are struggling with anxiety. And anxiety is a whole lot of things. So there's social anxiety, there's PTSD, there's OCD, there's panic disorder, there are the phobias, there's separation anxiety, there's performance anxiety. And I feel that God wants to deliver people from those today. I feel that God wants to free people from these things because he does not want us to live in fear. He does not want us to live in constant anxiety. That is not how he has intended us to live. We get to live in the wake of what Jesus did on the cross and go after these thoughts and go after these strongholds that prevent us from, from growing in our relationship with God. So if there's someone here who, who does struggle with any of those that I've mentioned, please feel free to stand up and would like to pray with you. I think the first battle in overcoming anxiety is standing up in a group of people. <laughs> and, and if that's you, please feel free to stand up. would like to pray with you. It's not to shame you. It's because it's a spiritual thing that we need to overcome. Anybody? Any takers? All right. So we have one person, two people, three people. So you guys have already, you've, you've won the first part of the battle, which is just standing up in a group full of people. I know how scary that is sometimes. Um, and so what we're going to do is that we as a church, we as a family, we're going to pray with these people. I don't want to be the one praying for them. I'm not going to lay hands on them. But those around them, could you just stand up and lay hands on them and we're going to pray for them. There's one person here who still needs more people. If, there you go. All right. I'll just pray and we can, we can pray for them as, as I'm also praying. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for, we thank you for your peace, your, your peace that surpasses all human understanding. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this peace for free, that we have not earned it. And that you do not want us to live in oppression, you do not want us to live in bondage, you do not want us to live in constant fear and constant worry. You want us to live in freedom. And I pray for these people, Lord, who are here today and are struggling with, with, with anxiety. I know, Father, that you do not want them to live this way. That, that this is not what you have intended for them to live. And so I pray, Father, that you through your Holy Spirit, through the precious blood of Jesus, that you will deliver them today. That you will free them from any bondage that they have had for years. That it does not matter how they got into it, but that you want to free them. And so I pray, Father, that even as you free them today, they will become a testimony of your power that they will go and then share their testimony so that others can be freed of this through your power. I pray, Lord, that you will use them as vessels and, and that their testimony will be used to overcome. We thank you for your peace. We thank you for your love, that you love all these people. In Jesus' name. And the second group of people I want to pray for are people who are just in a season of tension. Maybe you do not struggle with anxiety. Maybe you're just in a, in a season where everything is just pulling at you. Maybe it's work, maybe it's family life, maybe it's, it's just your personal life where the enemy keeps on bringing worry and fear into your life. 
where the enemy wants to make you question whether God is faithful or not. And I'd like to pray for those people too. If, if that's you, please stand up too, that's, if that's okay with you. Um, okay, so there are one, two, three people. And, and if we can just stretch our hands to these people and go close to them too, that works too. Lord, we thank you for, we thank you for your power. We thank you that your word comes alive in us and that your word is there, Father, to carry us through these seasons of tension. And I pray for these people, Lord, who are here today and are in seasons where the enemy is trying to bring disruption into their life, where the enemy is trying to bring lies, deceit, fear, worry, anxiety. And we just come against that in the, but in the name of Jesus. We come against any plans of the enemy to bring worry, to bring fear, to scare them into turning away from you, into knowing you on an intimate level on a daily basis. We pray, Father, that these people will experience your power and your presence in these seasons of tension and that they will come out of it overcomers that whatever it is that they will overcome it because tension is meant to be overcome through the power of your blood and so i pray father that your blood will just cover them that your word will come alive in their lives and that they will abide in your presence give them vision lord i pray that you will give them dreams and visions today and tonight as they sleep that you will reveal to them what you are doing in these seasons of tension. Reveal to them what you are doing through them. We thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit is here with them, that they do not have to go through this alone, that you are with them every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And... Um, lastly, I'd like to call on the, the Alta ministry team. We, we, we also have our pastoral care here in this church. And if you feel that maybe you are struggling with anxiety or you, you need help getting over it, you need help getting over this anxiety, we have our pastoral care team um, that is more than willing to walk with you in receiving freedom and living in freedom and overcoming tension. So please feel free to reach out to them. There's Richard, Uncle Richard, and Auntie Grace. There's Mam Lapo. They're part of our pastoral care team, um, and they are more than happy to, to work with you. We also have our altar ministry team. Um, if you need prayer for anything, um, they are more than happy to pray with you. Otherwise, have a, have a great week. Thank you.